it's time for us to welcome Jonathan Shuttleworth and thank him for what a blessing he's been. Thank you so much. Give Jesus a great big hand clap. I promise you he's the only one worth clapping for. Come on, it's Easter Sunday. Make a joyful noise under your risen Savior. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, he's alive. <laughs> Lift both your hands wherever you're seated. As we, I conclude my final service with you in Port Elizabeth. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor and Sister Crumpton. I thank you for the wonderful honor it's been to bless these wonderful people. And now on what may be my final service ever with these people, I pray that you would use me to impart a strong blessing to them where they'll never be the same. Every unresolved issue of every life, let it be taken care of tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you that not one person will leave here anything like how they came. Every person changed from glory to glory, from victory to victory, and from strength to strength. For all these things, we're careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. For it's to you and you alone who it's due. In Jesus' mighty name, we've prayed. And everybody said? Amen. Clap your hands one more time to the Lord. I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. On Good Friday, we spoke about the crucifixion and how the blood of Jesus broke the curse over everyone's life. And today, in the morning, we dealt elementary with the, the uh, resurrection. And I basically stayed on the fact that it gave everyone power to live in dominion over sin. On this closing service... I want to talk to you about the resurrection gifts that were given to men that believe in Christ when Jesus was raised from the dead. Most people, and I, don't, I know the difference between many and most, most people, by far, most preachers, most churches, they don't get anywhere close to what you're going to hear tonight. It's that Jesus died so our sins can be forgiven. He rose again so we can go to heaven. Those are two wonderful things. But they don't get in to the spiritual empowerment that's given to believers because they believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 27 that when Christ died, immediately resurrection power was loosed. So that many godly Jews, not a few, many, that were in their tombs came out of their tombs and walked around the city for the space of several hours. That's at the end of Matthew 27. So notice that. Immediately when Jesus gave up the ghost and finished his work, resurrection life was imparted to even those that had died before Jesus had, had paid the price. So much so that they got up from their tombs and walked around. Christianity is not you trying to join a religion. Christianity is a new birth. You remember when Jesus explained it to Nicodemus. He's... He explained it in such a way that Nicodemus' response was, how can I, being a grown man, crawl back inside my mother and be born again? That's how literal Jesus explained, literally Jesus explained the new birth. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, they are a new creature. In the Greek, a new species of being. The old life is dead. Behold, all things become new. Any kind, and I, this has concerned me, coming to Africa this trip, because I see that the preachers here are infatuated with American ministry. American Christianity should stay in America. It doesn't even work there. Trust me, I go there. It's gone from 82% church attendance in the 1980s to now it's down to 27%. And that's with Texas driving the average way up. You go to a state like Vermont, 13% church attendance. Washington State, 15% of people go to church. It's turning into Europe. 
because they've taken the power of Christianity and made it instead to now you can wear jeans, there's lattes at the back. Listen, I can drink as much lattes as anyone. I'm not anti-latte, I'm pro-latte. I have blue jeans, they're wonderful. But if you think that the reason people aren't coming to church is because they've always wanted to come but didn't think they could find coffee there, or they've always wanted to come but felt uncomfortable not wearing blue jeans, you're wrong. You can do all of those physical, secular things, and it's not going to draw anybody in. That what people crave on the inside, people are sick with all of the medical science available. There's the most sickness there's ever been. There's the most incurable sickness there's ever been. Marriages are in the worst shape they've ever been. People's children, stuff that people used to go through when they were 31 years old. Now you have children going through at 12, 13, 14. Man craves contact with the Spirit of God. And if they can't get it in church, the church will remain empty. How, how much of a shame is it for people to be hurting and they can't find the answer in church? But I tell you, in this last hour of time, God said, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. There will be a move of God in this last day that touches every age group and God's church will be on fire before we'll cart out of here. If you know you're a part of that church, let God hear you tonight. Clap those hands and shout unto God. Resurrection gifts. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 8, that's why the scriptures say, when Jesus ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to people. When Jesus ascended, there were gifts given to men. What gifts? Well, if you read below here, it deals with ministry gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Those are gifts. People that aren't in the ministry shouldn't be in the ministry. You don't just have anybody that can speak well and be organized, be in the ministry. This is called the high and holy calling of Christ Jesus and their gifts given that no man has anything to do with. I told you I was eight years old getting changed for bed like my mother told me. Go up and put your pajamas on. Minding my own business. I bent over and picked my pajamas up. When I looked up, there was an angel on the other side of the room. The angel said, Jonathan, God has reserved you for this last period of time to be an evangelist. So I paid attention. That's why when they offered me to be a youth pastor in Boston and I had no other job offers, I said no. When they offered me to do the same thing in, uh, outside of Pittsburgh and they were going to give me a house and a salary. And I lived with my parents at the time. So it was very enticing. I said no. They said, won't you even take a day to pray about it? I said no. They said, we're not confused as Christians. Why not? Because I already heard what my instructions are. I'm not to pastor. I'm not a prophet. You know, just because you prophesy doesn't make you a prophet. You can have ground meat, hamburger meat in your refrigerator, but that doesn't make you wimpy. Amen. So just because you prophesy, you're not a prophet. But these are ministry gifts that God gave to the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. I find it very troubling that people that are full gospel people are looking at ministries in America where they're run by people that don't even believe in the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're Baptist and you grew up Baptist, I don't have a problem with you being Baptist. But if you've had a taste of the Holy Ghost and now you're trying to model your church after these American church services with their 90 minute in and out fast food service where nobody gets touched, Nobody gets changed. Nobody gives. People come oppressed, leave oppressed. Your child has a drug problem at that church, they refer you to a rehab clinic. Your child's sick, they refer you to a doctor. They refer everybody because they don't have the power to deal with the needs of men. In the Bible, Jesus never referred anyone to anywhere but him. You know, Jesus had a doctor that traveled with him. His name was Luke. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples, but Christian history tells you he was one of the 72. So Luke came and wrote. He was a medical doctor. Jesus didn't pray for people that had a sinus infection. And then if he got to somebody that had leprosy, say, oh my goodness, leprosy? I'm going to refer you to Luke. 
He has lotion for you to rub on your fingers and your nose. That will help you with your skin. Come back twice a week. And the church now, because Americans buy up so much TV time, they think that that's success. To give a nice 30-minute message, no altar service, no laying on of hands, no altar call. Let that stay in America. And let me kill it there. Because when I go back, that's what I look to do. African Christianity is what's needed. Raw faith. All night prayer. Morning prayer. Because it takes power to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is going to fill you anew and afresh with that power tonight. If you believe it, can you say the loudest amen? I was preaching. I won't say where I was preaching. And they told me, the the pastor leaned over to me on the platform. It was 1145. He leaned over and he said, if you could have the mic to me back at 1215 on the dot. I said, if you'd like, I'll just give you the mic now. I already told you how the Lord blessed me. I have plenty of money. I don't need to preach for an offering. How the heck am I supposed to preach? Give an altar call for people to be saved and lay hands on the sick in 35 minutes. Can't do it. Gave more time to recognizing people that had birthdays in that month than they did to the preaching of the gospel. See how the crowd keeps growing? And we've only been here one weekend. If we had Monday night service, it would be more full. Because I'm in America, trust me, if you can do it in America, you can do it anywhere. I got my own sound system in America, my own stage, have worship leaders in, I'm going to have Neville in. When I go back to America, because if the church wants to kick the Holy Ghost out, I'll be happy to leave with the Holy Ghost. I've found that in any country, if you stand up and preach the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and allow the Spirit of God to move, it cheaply and easily breaks the hold of the devil on every life. Can you say amen? I have a YouTube channel. I'd encourage you to go on it. Just search Jonathan Shuttlesworth. You might have to take a break for water in between typing my name. (laughs) When you finish, click on my YouTube channel and watch what God did in Philadelphia. We had no church participation. It was a Muslim area of North Philadelphia. One of the ten most violent places in the nation. And we preached outdoors. I just decided to do what Reinhard Bonnke did in Nigeria. What they've done all through Africa. It works anywhere. So I just put up a stage, got the permit, paid about $143,000 U.S., over a million rand, closer to two million by the time it was all done, of my own money, and did it. Had two 18-wheelers came, fed everybody in the neighborhood. We had 1,400 grocery boxes to give out, or 2,000, excuse me. On the last night, we had 800 left and 1,400 people in line. And if you tell people in the inner city in the United States, stay in line, everybody will get a box. And then with 600 people left, you say we're out of boxes. They're going to have to send a helicopter to evacuate me out of there. (laughs) The boxes never ran out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a faith preacher. But when somebody tells me something like that, we had had 800 boxes with 1,400 in line and the boxes never ran out. I don't say praise the Lord. I say you need to learn how to count. But when the man that's in charge of giving out boxes runs an accounting firm, then you can't say you need to learn how to count. And all three of the workers had good jobs crying. They were saying, we're going to die. We're going to run out of boxes and these people are going to kill us. And they said we had two rows in the 18-wheeler of food boxes left and we never got to the back row. Then finally, when we got to the back row, we handed the last box to the last person. And when we looked, there was one more box. He still, El Shaddai, he is the, listen, he he is the Lord God and he changes not. It's man that changes. It's man that thinks they're too smart for the simple gospel. They start doing all these things that cut altar service down, cut down the laying on of hands, cut down the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
This is not an hour where we need less of the Holy Ghost. This is an hour where we need the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost that this generation, that this world's ever seen. And I tell you in the name of Jesus, we're not going to watch it happen tonight. We're going to get it on it right from the front. You are leaving here filled with the fire of God. If you know that tonight, take 10 more seconds and let Jesus know that you're interested. Clap those hands and shout unto God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says it will be a sign of the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 5. You should know this, Timothy. It starts at verse 1. In the last days, people will be boastful and proud, arrogant, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. Goes on for four verses. And then in the fifth verse, Paul told Timothy this will be a sign of the last days. People will have a form of godliness, but they'll reject the power that would make them godly, have nothing to do with people like that. Yet here you have full gospel preachers going to church growth conferences run by people that wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if he walked in with a red hat on. And they listen. What are you doing to grow the church? Who cares what they're doing? Just because something's big doesn't make it good. If I busted my ankle in the parking lot tonight, My ankle would get very big, but not because it's strong, because it has a problem. And you'll find in many of these churches, they have a lot of attendance. We could do lots of things to get attendance up in the church. We could announce that we have models dancing in bikinis. We'd have every drunk man from Port Elizabeth in here. But nobody would leave changed. The church is not just supposed to attract a crowd. The church is to carry power that when the crowd comes in, they can be set free. When I said that to that pastor on the platform, he looked at me with real big eyes. He said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not trying. You know, you, you understand, I didn't say that because that was the first service that happened. The entire week, that's all he said. Let's be done by this time. Let's be done by this time. Never one time, let's believe for this many people to get saved. Never one time, let's believe that God's going to make the cripple walk tonight. So by Sunday, I had enough. And when he said, no, no, you you can take longer. I said, no. I said, ever since I got here, all you're concerned about is going home. So let's just go home. You can be happy. I said, the reason I didn't become an Anglican priest or a Catholic priest or a Baptist minister and the reason I got into full gospel ministry was so that we could not only preach but minister to the people instead of getting up and giving a speech and closing in prayer. That's full gospel ministry. And I'm going to tell you, the nations of the world are in danger of selling out full gospel ministry for something that has a form and a power thereof. I'm going to tell you something. When that angel called me to preach, I had a speech impediment. Eight sounds in the alphabet that I couldn't say right. It would not have been possible for me to preach the gospel in the state I was in. How can you speak publicly when you can't even speak privately? My legs turned in. Two different procedures on my legs. They're crooked. I can still turn this one almost all the way around. And the power of God got rid of my speech impediment. And then I had an old lady in Pittsburgh come up to me at the end of one of my meetings in 2013. She said, you probably don't remember me. But I was your teacher when you were three years old. Where are the braces that are on your legs? I said, back in hell with my speech impediment. So, it's very easy to believe in miracles when you are a miracle. The Bible says that God, 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, God deliberately chose the things deemed foolish by the world. I'm sure out of the six billion people on earth, when the Lord called me in 1988, he had six billion better options. Who in their right mind calls somebody to preach that can't speak? But the Bible says, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest of man's wisdom. I see America creeping into South Africa. I see it creeping into the minister's. This is my third trip in less than 12 months, so I'm not basing it on my trip here. Contend for old-time 
Pentecost. Contend for the move of God. Contend for fiery altar services, for therein lies the secret to drive the devil out, to break the neck of poverty, and to set men and women free. If you think you can get the leaders of political parties and the leaders of denominations to get together and pose for a photograph on Instagram, and that's going to reconcile racial problems, you've lost your mind. The only hope for the nations of the world is a sweeping move of the Holy Ghost. That's why we should start tonight and say, Lord, let it begin in me. Shake me. Shake Port Elizabeth and use me to shake my generation. If that's why you're here, let God I'll hear you one more time. Clap your hands and shout unto God. He gave gifts. Ministry can't take place outside of a supernatural gift. You don't just let anybody speak because they have an education. It's a high, holy calling. Got somebody, you know, get bored with their job and want to dabble in the ministry. It's not something to be dabbled in. It's something you put both your hands on. Put both your hands on the plow and don't look back. Does Pastor Crumpton dabble in the ministry? Does he have a couple things he does on the side? Then when he has time, he shows up for church. No. One thing for 50 years or more. And that's what the ministry is. It's not something you do to supplement your income. And I believe tonight, God is going to put his hand on young people and call you to give your life to full-time Christian service. And then you'll immediately have your Christian relatives tell you that you need to get an education and a job so that you can have something to fall back on. Just remember, everybody that tells you that, I have more money than all of them combined. I only say that so when they tell you the ministry doesn't pay anything, just show them a picture of me. Do I look poor? It's not an act. I'm well taken care of. Because when you serve God with all your heart, God takes good care of you. The Bible says in John 4, the laborer doth receive, not wages, good wages. I mentioned in the service before this that I had an invitation to do an outdoor meeting at Penn State University in the United States, one of the top 10 party schools in America. And so a 23-year-old from the Congo that was going to school there that was a Christian, it took an African to do it. Because if it was an American, their, their way to reach the campus is by having everybody come in a room with 10 chairs, having like something to eat, some Coke, and then they get people saved one every two years probably. Well, this African, they know better. They know you can put up a stage anywhere, turn the sound system up and preach, and the gospel works. So he approached three different campus ministries and they all said, no, that doesn't work in America. Let me tell you something. It'll work anywhere. If the Lord opened the door, I'd put a stage up in Brussels, Belgium, and Muslims would get saved faster than they could bring them in from Syria. I just just finished preaching in Finland. We had three Iraqis get saved the first night and by the end of the week, there were three rows of Iraqis. So I'll tell you, the devil's making a big mistake. If he wants to take Muslims from a place where they can't hear the gospel and bring them to countries where they can hear the gospel, I'm going to make him sorry he came up with that plan. Can you say amen? I believe there'll be strong Syrian churches, strong Iraqi churches, strong Iranian churches. This is the hour of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'll try to make my church survive. He said, I will build my church. Not Cause it to survive. I will build my church of the increase. Everybody say increase. Increase. Say increase. increase. Of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. 
Some idiot wrote on Twitter. They're the head of a divinity school. The church is dying. You know, I don't know if I can repeat in church what I wrote back to him. That stuff ticks me off. Church is dying. Jesus is the head of the church. And it's been being built for 2,000 years. And it's not going to slow down right now. It's going to speed up. Turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah, the 60th chapter. Verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise and shine, for your light has come. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth. No kidding. Everybody's experts on that. The rise of terrorism, the rise of Zika virus. We can clearly see that there's plenty of darkness to go around. But what did God say? That darkness covers the earth, so build a bomb shelter, get some bottled water and some guns, and try to survive till the rapture. You got TV shows in America where people are building bomb shelters. And most of them are Christians. I'd say on the show about half of them say they're Christians. I know what the Bible says is coming and I'm prepared. One guy said, I have 1,100 guns. Well, you only have two hands, genius. (laughs) And if the U.S. Army rolls rolls up on your door, it's not gonna be a Wild West shootout. Saddam Hussein had a $5 billion military grade bunker five stories below the earth. And they got him in 18 hours when they came for him. We're not here trying to survive. God has put us here to take over, to change nations, to shake cities, not by might, not by physical or mental planning, but by the Spirit of God. Without that Spirit, any ministry, any person is cheap meat for the devil. He can come in at will and destroy I haven't even gotten to to the scripture I wanted to read. I'll just stay with what I feel in my spirit. Because this just came back to me. When I was about 10 years old, I actually grew up in a church in Pennsylvania that much like what I see starting to happen in South Africa. It started out as a little church and then there came like a sweeping move of the Holy Ghost. Miracles like every service. Sunday night, Wednesday night, women Bible studies. Then when the church got big, they started to move away from it. Okay, that effect, you have to remember there's going to be judges that come and lawyers and doctors. And if they hear us speaking in tongues, you know, that could offend them. When the Bible says tongues is a sign, not to the, uh, to the believer, but to the unbeliever. You know, isn't it interesting that the whole way the church was launched was by a wind of God coming into a meeting people speaking in other tongues. And what was the reaction? It drew a crowd. And the crowd's reaction was these men are just drunk. So from the beginning, Satan can't stop the Holy Ghost. So all he can do is mock it and get you to disdain it in your heart. Well, I want to go to church, but you know, I don't want to be like that. Because he knows if you just take a form of it, but you don't have the power. He can mess you up. The devil only bows to one thing, and that's power. That's why you're leaving here with an overflow of power tonight in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. Amen. So I, I, I was, my mother grew up in the church when it was in the power phase. But when they got into the seeker sensitive, embarrassed of the Holy Ghost, no laying hands on people, well, we believe in that, but we, don't, we just don't feel it needs to be done. The whole way the church was birthed were people gathering, hearing their languages, and then saying, ah, these men are drunk. 
The first thing Peter had to do, the Bible says he got up and said, some of you are saying that we're drunk, but that's not true. People don't get drunk by nine in the morning. Peter had never been to Cape Town. Amen. (laughs) I always try to pick a city that's far enough away that people won't get offended. No, what you see today was predicted by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter didn't step forward and say, sorry about the disturbance. We'll try to keep it down. We really have let things get out of hand. They were all speaking in tongues and magnifying God. And when Peter stepped out in the anointing, that crowd went from mocking to saying, brethren, what must we do to be saved? And if Peter was an American preacher, he would have said, nothing, everything's okay. But he said, each of you individually must repent of your sins and turn to God for the remission of sin. Can you say amen? amen. So as the church got bigger that I was growing up in, they started, there started to be this movement in America to see how many churches could be planted by one church. So what ended up happening was, They had about two or three guys that were in the ministry. But once they exhausted them, they still wanted to plant more churches, so they started just sending out basically anybody. Guy that had been going to church for 25 years, you know, never pursued a call of God. And so we're in one church on Sunday, we're in church on Sunday morning. And they're having a going away service for this guy. Uh, They're live streaming, so I won't say his name. And it's a nice celebratory service. Brother so-and-so has gone here. Most of you know him. He's been here for 25 years. We're sending him out to Philadelphia. Let me tell you something about Philadelphia. You don't just go into some city. The devil will send you back in a bag. If you come with no power, you're going to get your head slapped. Did you ever hear the story, the Amityville Horror Show, that was based on that home in upstate New York that was full of the devil? And the priest went in with holy water and a cross. And he said, the priest said, As soon as I went in, something slapped me across the face and threw me out of the house. You'll get embarrassed. So just because you have a badge or you went to Bible school, if there is not a greater one on the inside of you, then you lose battle easy. Now my father has been an evangelist now for almost 40 years. That church wouldn't have him preach. And my dad would sit about two-thirds of the way back. My dad is very different from me. He's a gentleman, very polite, handsome, has muscles, good hygiene, very different from me. So when you hear me speaking and you hear how brash I am, my father is not like that. My dad's very diplomatic. You, you, you could totally take advantage of my father. He'd never say one word. He'd be happy to be taken advantage of. So this was very odd when this happened. And this church didn't believe in the Holy Ghost. In it. You know, they believed in it behind closed doors. But in the service, they discouraged messages in tongues. They discouraged any move of the Holy Spirit. You could see that if one of the old ladies that was there back when the Spirit used to move would get up and give a message in tongues, all the pastors on the planet. <laughs> then somebody would get up and give a two-minute apology. Some of you heard something right now that you're not used to hearing. We would just want to explain that, you know, like that. So they're having this nice, happy, going away party for this guy. Everybody's smiling. And my father stands up and gives a message in tongues and (laughs) and begins to walk. And I was sitting by my father. I felt when the Holy Spirit came on him, I was 10 or 11, I felt it. And when he stood up and gave that message in tongues, I'm telling you, There was a difference in the room. He gave the message in tongues, started to move out of the pew and walked down the front pointing at the men. Came up on the platform, then grabbed the man that was going away by the jacket lapels. Now now we're way out of line. And my father doesn't do stuff like this. And then my dad gave the interpretation of the tongue. On this guy's going away party. Totally ruined the party. My dad has tears streaming out of his eyes. And he said, thus saith the Lord, you have sought to do my work, but you're not ready. Consecrate thyself in fasting and prayer before you go, for the task is too great for you. And my dad finished. And they just all, you know, the guy was weeping, but nobody heeded the word. 
That guy went to Philadelphia in a gang area like where I preached. Total devils. One guy, when I preached, we had 2,564 people saved in five nights. There was a brother and sister that came. The sister came forward to the altar call. The brother said, I'm not going, and went back home. When he went back home, there were men waiting for him that blew his head off about a quarter of a mile or a tenth of a mile, a mile from the meeting. In fact, when I was on the stage preaching, I was a white guy, only white guy there, all about 3,700 black people in a rough area. Did you know I had to stop preaching? Because a police helicopter came and circled the field. They must have, somebody sent out a, you, somebody needs to rescue this skinny white guy. Because everybody was jumping up and down and I'm on the stage, they probably thought this is out of control. I would give any amount of money to hear the dispatch call back to police headquarters that he's not in trouble. What are they shouting? They're shouting hallelujah. They're shouting praise the Lord. So the anointing turned that around. Amen. This, this guy was not anointed. He was a nice guy, but your smile and nice teeth doesn't dethrone the devil. It takes power to dethrone the devil. Two weeks after he got there, I don't even know if it was a full two weeks, because nobody listened, you know. They just all pretended like nothing happened. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given us today. Well, as we were saying, we're sending Brother Joe. And away he went. Ten days later, his wife walked into the bathroom. He was in the bathtub babbling to himself with a stereo plugged into the electrical outlet, getting ready to throw it in the bathtub and kill himself. This was a guy with like a master's degree. You can't jerk around with the devil. And that's the problem. The more Western a country gets, the more people begin to exalt their intellect and think they, well, you know, really, I know what I'm doing. You don't. Without God, you can do nothing. But with the power of God, that's the thing. That's why on a night like tonight, do you understand they've already taken the offering for me? So I'll be paid the same whether I preach for 25 minutes and dismiss or preach like I'm going to preach and lay hands on everybody. So if you were me, what would you do? If your employer told you, okay, today at work, you can either stay 45 minutes or you can stay eight hours. You go home 45 minutes. So I don't do this because I don't like being alone. I love being alone. I don't know if I can think of 10 people I'd rather be with than myself. I got no problem sitting in my hotel room watching soccer. I'm not nervous. I don't need to get out of the house. The reason we preach is because preaching is a form of impartation. Ezekiel 2.2, 2, and his spirit entered into me when he spake to me. First Timothy, Timothy, stir up the gift, chapter four, that came on the inside of you through the prophetic word spoken to you and by the laying on of hands. So preaching under the unction of the Holy Ghost does not go into your head, it puts power into your spirit. That's why with a preacher like me, some of you went home on Friday or this morning and you said, man, that was a great message. And a friend of yours that wasn't in church said, what did the preacher speak about? And you said, I don't have a clue. (laughs) But I feel something on the inside of me. And then what happens is the word is loosed into your spirit. And you may not need it today. But at the time you're confronted, the thing that's been deposited in you will come out of your mouth and cut down every attack of the devil. Therefore, I prophesy again, the last attack you suffered will be the last attack. From now on, you do the attacking, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. If you're with me, take 15 seconds, clap those hands, and shout unto God. Please listen to me. Western Christianity doesn't work. Quit idolizing it. I can't think of five churches in the United States that have any business doing a conference on church growth. How are people from Africa coming to America to get ideas? Have you seen our country? Look what the church has produced. It's a mess. More black children aborted than born in New York City last year. 
And you want to model after our country? If the Lord didn't call me there to preach, I'd be, I'd be out of there so fast. They can keep their Starbucks and McDonald's. I want the Holy Ghost. With people leaving Africa, ministers, to attend minister conferences in the United States that think they're a hot shot because they have 8,000 people in their church. Meanwhile, there's churches in Nigeria that have 8,000 pastors on staff. God bless Nigeria. When they're not saved, they're the, they're the best criminals, and when they get saved, they're the best Christians. Can you say amen? I'll tell you. The national Bible verse for Nigeria is, I would that you be hot or cold. The sinners take that seriously, and the Christians take it seriously. Can you say amen? amen. Not me. I'm not going to America ministers' conferences. I went to Nigeria in December. Impartation service at 5.30 in the morning. 55,000 seat sanctuary. And there were no seats at 5.28. Everyone was seated by 5.30. And by the end of the meeting, there were 350,000 more people outside. And that's the second biggest church in Lagos. The biggest one is the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Holy Ghost Center. One kilometer by two kilometers seats half a million people they've gotten so many people saved that the muslims have quit meeting on friday and now meet on sunday that's a fact you would think if you built a building that was one kilometer by two kilometers you'd be done and now that building's too small it seats half a million and they've been having three to five million come in December. So now they're building a building, cash, three kilometers by three kilometers that will seat over a million people in a place with 40, what, 60% unemployment. God bless you, Nigeria. Nigerians love me, and I love them. And I love South Africa. And I'm making up my mind about America. <laughs> Three million people. Five million. You know, when he would give the altar call, Pastor Enoch had a boy that's 74 years old. And I'd watch that and weep and see a mob of people running. He would say, I'm going to count very slowly to 20. And I would see everyone running. I would think, look at their passion for God. But then I thought, no, that's not passion for God. If you're sitting at the back of the auditorium, you have 20 seconds to run two kilometers to the altar. Whether you have a passion for God or not, if you don't run, you're not going to get there till the next service starts. And it's amazing to me that that can be going on in Lagos, let alone what's going on in China, let alone what's going on in India. You know how they say there's 30 million Christians in India out of 1 billion people? It's not true. Because when I went door to door in India to pray for the sick and the pastor was taking me to his people, the woman had the red dot on her head and idols up in the house. And she said, I'm sick. Can you pray for me? Through the interpreter. And I said to the interpreter, tell her I'm not praying. And the interpreter said, well, what's your problem? I said, tell her if she has a problem, ask the idols to help her. But as long as they're up, I'm not helping. And the pastor said, no, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? And got ready to be upset. Tell them you're the one that doesn't understand. You should have no other gods before me. God doesn't work in conjunction with idols. But he said, no, you don't understand. These are her husband's idols. I said, well, what's with the red dot on her head? He said, you're allowed to beat your wife in India. Women don't have the same rights as a man. They have the same rights as property. And so if he knew she was a Christian, he would beat her to death. So she keeps the red dot. It's not even in her ability to take the idols down. But he said, what the women do is their husbands, most of them will start going out to drink at about 8 p.m. And they'll wait till he goes out to drink, wave by, and they all come to church. He said, she's a born-again Christian. And he told me, and I read it in another article, that though officially there's 30 million Christians in India, they estimate it's actually closer to 400 million people that are born again and speak with tongues in India. 
How can you have those massive churches in India, massive churches in Lagos, Bishop Oyedepo's church outside of Lagos, Nigeria, they're now building a 100,000 seat auditorium that's air conditioned, 276 million US dollars and paying cash. You say, oh yeah, but they're crooked. No, he's 62, he's with his same wife. And if you're crooked, the first one that leaves is the wife. Did you know they took me on a tour of the property while I was there? We took the tour by automobile. And the tour was an hour and 15 minutes never getting out of the car. They have over 10,000 acres just there. How can you have a move of God going on like that? Where they average 2,500 new decisions for Christ every Sunday. And TBN never breathes a word of it in the United States. They just ignore it. Because if you showed people that, then nobody would have any interest in all the little peons anymore that think they're the big generals. And if you showed that, people would realize, boy, how are you able to do that? What video announcements do you show? And I'm not against video announcements. I have videos. But when you think you can put on a production that will draw people out of sin and into the kingdom of God, you've missed it. If they ask them, What's the secret? They would tell them. All we're doing is what they do in the book of Acts. We fast and pray. We win people to Christ. We lay hands. Man, I, I watched one meeting. Bishop Oyedepo got up to speak. And he normally doesn't do this. He's a teacher. As soon as he got the mic, it bursted out in his spirit. Is there no balm in Gilead? There was a woman whose 12-year-old daughter had died. 10, excuse me. She brought the daughter's corpse to the meeting, dead for 18 hours, confirmed at two different hospitals. And they said, you can't bring the corpse in here. And they put it in the third floor storage area. When he said, is there no balm in Gilead? The daughter jerked back to life and came down and joined her mother. That's how churches grow. And many believed on him, seeing the miracles that he did. Are you the Messiah or should we look for another? That's a simple yes or no question. Jesus answered like this. Go tell your master the, thi the, the things you've seen today. The blind see. The deaf hear. The cripple walk. The poor having the gospel preached to them. The lepers are cleansed. Go tell him, that's how you know I'm the Messiah. Nobody ever cast a devil out in the Old Testament. Not anywhere. Elijah never did it. Elisha never did it. Closest thing you have is David played the harp and a tormenting spirit left Saul, but nobody cast a devil out. Jesus came and cast him out. Gave that power to us. The book of Acts is a recipe on how to shake any city. And I'm telling you, a beguiling devil has got people that when they got in the ministry, they wanted to get in the supernatural power of God. Now they think, you know, just, just, just be casual and it's different now. It's not different. I'm going to tell you something. Because if anywhere is westernized, it's America. I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost can do. By his gifts that nothing else can do. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 5. Where are you? Is it there? Oh, this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. What gifts did Jesus give us in redemption? Revelation 5. Revelation 5, verse 11. Listen carefully. Then I looked again. And I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and of the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Why? He didn't die for fun. Part of his work was to receive seven things and they weren't to receive them for him. Because he was already the son of God. He received them 
for us. That those who are in Christ by redemption receive this sevenfold redemptive package. What's the package? Who was slaughtered to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength. Everybody say strength. strength. What kind of strength? The kind of strength to preach five times in three days and feel better than when you started in the morning. The kind of strength to make a man in his 70s outrun the king's chariot. Not in Nike shoes. He was either wearing sandals or barefoot in a rope and ran past horses in his 70s. Abraham. When I was younger, I used to think it was a miracle that he had a son when he was 100. Now that I have a child, I think about raising a five-year-old boy when you're 105. Abraham led men out to battle when he was over 80 years old. Not sent men, led men and returned victorious. And they didn't have guns. So that means Abraham beat people to death in his 80s. Do you know how embarrassing it must be to get beaten to death by an 85-year-old man? If it was me, I'd say, please, just finish me. I, I don't want to go back to the bar and have my friends say, Hey, hey, Hank, how old was that guy that beat you up? Uh, I think he was in his 50s. No. We heard he's 87. You'd get made fun of for the rest of your life. What kind of strength? It's not just healing. It's strength for your bones. Life for your flesh. Can you say amen? amen. Lift your hands all over this place. Every weakness remaining in your body, in your abdominal wall, wherever it is, I tell you, you receive strength now in the name of Jesus Christ. If you receive it, let your amen be the loudest. Yeah. Strength. Not just healing. Strength. If Jesus doesn't come back and you're still alive, I'll come back here and preach when I'm 85. And you'll lean over to your great-grandchild and say, after I've preached the third hour, you'll say, I don't know what got into him. He used to preach much shorter. He used to be much calmer. Now he preaches hours. So strong, he doesn't just stand up on one chair. He walks over the top of the chairs. Because if you think one day I'm gonna be an old man, Talking about how the Lord used to use me back when I was in my 30s. No. I promise you every year that the Lord keeps me on this earth, I'll be taking new ground. I'll be doing bigger things. Not by might, but by the strength of God. And I tell every one of you in the balcony, every one of you on the floor, your best days are not behind you. Today, you receive strength to take your mountain in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody say strength. strength. Honor. Honor. For your shame, you shall have honor. That's what the Bible says. You don't seek honor from your culture, from the government. You let God honor you. And when God exalts you, the world will know you've been exalted. Lift your hands all over this place one more time. Every issue of your life that's brought you shame, inability to have children, inability to get married, inability to hold a job, you receive a double portion of honor now in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> honor. The Bible says in Acts 28 that Paul went to Malta and began to preach. Stand up, this lady here that was with you. Yeah. She helped me in Philadelphia. She was in the Philadelphia meeting. Stand up. Step right over. Lift both hands. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. And Jan, too late for him.
If you stand for the Holy Ghost, he'll come into your life and he comes into your meetings. If you don't like the Holy Spirit, if you wish stuff like that wouldn't happen, you'll never see him again. God said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. He actually said in Samuel, I will despise those that lightly esteem me. So you don't even have to be ashamed. If you lightly esteem the things of God, oh, you know, I've heard people make the most calloused, stupid comments about the Holy Ghost. They'll say to a preacher that flows in the Holy Ghost, well, what are you going to do when you come this time? Just lay hands on everybody and have everybody fall on the ground again? Lightly esteem. Forgetting that when those people go on the ground, what did God do with Adam? He put him out cold and did a work on him to create a wife. So why would it seem funny to anyone that God would put, a surgeon will put you out. So why wouldn't God put you out on the floor? It's not that you fall out. It's what's happening when you're out. You must, any ministers that are here, and any Christians, you must guard against this modern move to lightly esteem the things of the Spirit. I think, I, I think there's this move to imitate America. Okay, I know we used to do that in Africa, but it's different now. Yeah, it is different. It's worse. We don't need less of the anointing. We need more of the anointing. The Bible says, and Paul, when he went to the island of Malta, after he was shipwrecked, a snake bit him. He threw the snake into the fire. Acts 28, 1 to 12. And they waited for him to swell up and die. And when he swelled, didn't swell up and die. They said, this man is a God in a mortal body. And the governor had an assistant named Publius who was sick of a high fever. And he sent for Paul. Paul healed him. Then the entire island brought unto him their sick. And he laid his hands on them and ministered to them. And after he finished, the Bible says, the entire island in one accord showered Paul with honor and gifts in less than 24 hours by the anointing. He went from shipwrecked prisoner to staying at the governor's palace with every, if every person in the city brings you a gift, you're rich. And the Bible says, and you can look it up in the original language, high honor gifts. That means they weren't saying, thank you, Paul, for healing my father of cancer. Here's five rand. They were bringing unto him the best of what they had. They have that billboard hanging up in the back of your church. Crowds undress at P.E. Church. Where when Dr. Rodney Howard Brown was here. And a move of God swept through the crowd in giving. And people began to put all their money on the altar. Then when they ran out of money, men started to put their suit jackets, shoes, women their coats. People started to go home and get their bicycles. Until clothes were stacked three and a half feet high. And that same billboard read the week before, police run out of petrol. So in the midst of there being not enough, God, by a supernatural move, moved on the people to give. Let me tell you, with the anointing, you don't have to beat an offering out of people. You don't even have to teach much. Did Jesus have to teach the wise men on the importance of giving gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Or just being anointed? Did he sit his little baby self in a manger and men see the star and go and travel and say, we must bring gifts and lay them? Did Elijah have to hold a Ravens Partners Conference? Did Elijah have to send a newsletter out to the Raven community letting them know he's a prophet and if they'd be so kind to sow bread and meat, he would be greatly appreciated? No. He sat down and God reversed what used to take from people. Ravens don't bring food. Ravens take food. And God reversed the natural order. That what is on this earth that takes from everyone else began to give to him. Lift your hands all over this place. As you receive honor as a redemptive gift, what works against people that are in this world will work for you. God will turn everything around for your good tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, clap those hands and shout one more time because Jesus was slain that you might have it. 
Hey! You got to have the Holy Ghost. I said you have to have the Holy Ghost. The West. The West is dying. They don't know what to do. 49 active ISIS cells. Uh, 49 states have active ISIS cells in America. So it's, without a revival, it's already over. It will be a cold day in hell between those, but when those people run me out. I'm going to run the devil back out of my country. Amen. You know, I didn't get this skinny by wishing. While everybody's making fun of fasting, I don't think you need to do all that. Well, go ahead. Think what you want. But if Jesus is the Son of God, often withdrew to fast and pray. I'm going to bury myself in the Bible and find everything Jesus did and what the apostles did because God is no respecter of persons. If you do what they did, you will get what they got. How come you're not eating it? You know, I have ministers ask me when I'm at a table. How come you're not eating anything? Take a wild guess. Put two and two together, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'll give you a hint. It starts with an F and it rhymes with blasting. How come you're not having anything? Because I'm having a bout with anorexia right now. Because I'm trying to get in shape for bathing suit season to go to the beach. Then I'll tell them, I'm fasting. Why? Well, you know, there's some crazy thing I came up with. If you do what they did, you get what they have. And you live at a far lower level than where God wants you to live if you don't have the manifest. What did Paul say? After shaking Europe, Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. A man that had garments that were, if he preached in this vest, he didn't have to go pray for anyone. You take the vest, put it on the person, and when the residue of his anointing that was in the clothes made contact with their body, the Bible says any sickness or disease was healed and any evil spirit came out with fastings often. I thank God I pray in tongues more than ye all. Pray always in the Holy Ghost. Pray at all, Ephesians 6, pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Spirit. You know what they told me in American Sunday school at a full gospel church? We, I remember it. I was 10. We had that as our verse. And the teacher read it. Pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Spirit. Then you know what our next words were? Now that doesn't mean you have to pray all the time. Really? Then Paul was a horrible writer. Because you really get the impression when he says pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Spirit that he means pray at all times. You know, people mock that now. You know, people think you have to pray an hour a day. You should pray at least that. Jesus said, could you not pray with me even one hour? Because when you pray in the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 14, he that prays in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but he speaks to God and buildeth himself up. Praying in the Holy Ghost churns the engine of the Spirit and causes the anointing that's dormant in your spirit to begin to bubble up and overflow. Lift your hands all over this auditorium. When I lay hands on you tonight, if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in other tongues, you receive it easily tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody say honor. honor. Glory. And blessing. You don't wait to heaven. You don't wait till you get to heaven to get the glory of God. Turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 30.
Romans 8.30. I want to tell you something. If you let hands get laid on you tonight and really commit to this, Sangoma will clear out of your way without you opening your mouth. Bishop Oyedepo, when he built that church, it was in the forest in Ota where the witches practiced. And he asked one of the witches that came into the church, How come I've never had any problem with you? She said, when we sense a higher power than us, we clear out of the way. The devil knows when he's beat, and the devil knows who he can beat. Even if you're filled with the Spirit, if you maintain a low anointing. It's not easy in South Africa. The rand's at 16 to 1 to the dollar now. and the You just repeat everything that's against you. Devil will whoop you, no problem. But when you know that the resurrected Jesus not only is seated at the right hand of God by a mystery, divine mystery of the Holy Ghost, he lives in me. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. You will dethrone the devil in every area of life with ease. I prophesy again in the name of Jesus from this day forward. You go from victory to victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody shout glory. glory. Romans eight twenty nine. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. Everybody say I'm like Jesus. How many of you know we're far below where we should be? No, I, speak for yourself, my friend. My poor wife. She didn't know what she was getting into when she married me. I was sitting in a meeting. I can't take it anymore. If you can't tell, I can't take it. People speaking against the word of God. And like this, this warped, powerless version of Christianity. Guy said right from the pulpit. How many of you know we miss the mark every day? I just, speak for yourself. My wife looked at me with real big guys. I said, let's go. Let's get something to eat. <laughs> Watching rugby would have a stronger anointing than listening to this guy. I'm not criticizing somebody that's not a good preacher. It's a difference to, to, to be working on being a good preacher and be saying the opposite of what the Bible says. How many of you know we miss it every day? No, I don't. When have I missed it today? Between the three services I've been at. Unless it's a sin to take a nap, and it's not. If it was, I'd go to hell. I didn't miss it today. What about when this service is over? Am I going to a strip club? Or am I going to go with Pastor Crumpton to go eat in the cafe? Then somebody's going to drop me back off of my hotel, and I'm going to sleep. I'm going to wake up and fly to East London in the morning. And carry on preaching at 7 p.m. again all week. Get on a plane on Saturday. Fly back to America. Land at 1 p.m. And start preaching at 7 p.m. I don't have time to sin. If the devil came to tempt me, he would have to make an appointment sometime in September. If a spirit came into my room, I'd say, I'm sorry, I have no time for you. I don't mean to offend you, but you'll have to maybe in September. (laughs) Call my office. Amen. No time. I'm busy doing the work of the Lord. Do you know God has a purpose for your life? And if you'll busy yourself in that purpose, you'll never, you will not miss it. Do you know when David missed it? The Bible says in the season when kings went to war, David stayed home and stood on his rooftop. And begin. You're not to be standing on your rooftop looking around. There is work to do. If you'll throw yourself headlong into your tasks. My friend here on the front row that's a pastor. Him and a friend of his invited me to go speak on the radio on Bay 107.9 FM. After Friday night. Midnight to two. When they invited me, what do you think I said? Oh, you know, it's very late. Please. I'm just getting warmed up. Amen. I said, let's go. Can go on the radio and say whatever I want to whoever I want. The worst they can do is deport me. I'm going home anyway. Turn the mic on and I'll talk. It's supposed to be midnight to one. We went to about 
20 to 2 a.m. And when we were driving home, your pastor there from Tanzania said to me, he said, man, can I ask you a question? How are you so fresh? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, it's almost three in the morning and you seem like you're just getting started for the day. That's how I felt. I have a hard time getting wound down. I called my wife and daughter before I went to bed, talked to them till about 3.30 in the morning. Oh, I can pop up. You know, Peter was not a poet. Peter was not in the arts. Peter was a commercial fisherman, which to this day is still one of the two most dangerous jobs on earth, most physically taxing. And Jesus taught, then preached, to 5,000 people with no sound system. Remember when I was here two years ago for Easter and somebody ripped the wires out on the street and I had to preach to 1,200 with no sound system? You can't sit on a stool with a glass of water and say, welcome everybody, so glad you're here. (laughs) He, that's why the Bible says, he called unto them in a loud voice. That uses your, your strength. Come unto me. With an exclamation point. All that are thirsty. And I will give you, all you that are weary, and I will give you rest. Spoke. So he teach, then preach. Then the village brought unto him all of their sick. And no matter what their sickness, one touch of his hand healed them all. So when Peter, who was a hard worker, saw Jesus teach, then preach. Then lay hands on everybody. And when people started bringing their kids, Peter thought, oh, okay, enough's enough. Leave the kid." And Jesus said, no, 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 bring them. Peter said, where does he get his strength? And Jesus said, John 4, I get my physical nourishment from doing the will of the Father who sent me. When you find what it is that God has called you to do, that... You know, that's why there's certain things that if you had to read about it for five minutes, it, you need a nap. But there's other things that you can read about for three hours and it feels like five minutes went by. When you find what it is that God's called you to do and you immerse yourself in it, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They shall run. I tell everybody here that's stymied, everybody that's stagnant, you're going to run tonight. You're going to finish your race. You're going to receive the prize in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. What does the Holy Spirit do? I'm going to give you one example before I lay hands on you of how you can't match what the Holy Spirit does. He'll do in three minutes what people couldn't do in 50 years. I was preaching at a church in Ohio and I got to the service about 25 minutes late on purpose because if I had to listen to American praise and worship, I'd have quit the ministry about 15 years ago. Sad, depressing. We're so broken. We're so unworthy. By the time they finish, I start looking for a cliff to fling myself off of. So I started coming in about 25 minutes late, just so whatever the Lord had laid on my heart in the hotel, I could just stay clear. So I get there, start preaching. Everybody's stone cold. And then I see a lady in the fourth row, center section, maybe third, so it'd be about where you are. And while I'm preaching like you saw me do on Friday where I called that one lady out right off the beginning, Right in the middle of my message, I see the Lord touching her. And I walked up to her and I said, you know, very kindly, because I could tell this church wasn't used to this stuff. I said, stand up, dear lady. And when I said stand up, she went like this. So, you know, this was a full gospel church. So I started to think, you know, what's with these people? This isn't a big deal. So very kindly a second time. I said, no, no, don't worry about it. Stand up. She went like this. So I figured to diffuse the tension, because she must have been like timid or shy. I said, lady, look how skinny I am. I can't hurt you. Just stand up. (laughs) But I knew the Lord wanted me to minister to the woman. I just wanted to lay hands on her to receive the Holy Ghost. So I grabbed her by the arm and pulled her to her feet. And I said, step out into the aisle. And she went like this. I was thinking, lady, it's not a big deal. 
You're in the aisle. There's 110 people in this church, tops. Relax. Then the church didn't have any catchers, because I assume they don't do this kind of ministry. So her husband was sitting next to her, who I assumed was her husband. And I said, sir, I'm going to put you into the ministry for about three minutes. Get up and stand behind your wife. He stood, and he's crying. So I'm thinking maybe he's getting touched by the power of God. I don't know what's happening. Uh, but, you know, you have to pretend like you do because you're in charge. This is, very, this is all very normal. <laughs> so I said, lift your hands, lady. She lifted her hands. I said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, she shot back into her husband, who was a big man, and when she hit him, he shot out, both of them speaking in tongues, and bounced off the floor because there's no catchers. And again, I thought, whoa, but I had, yes, this is all very normal. We've seen this many times. As soon as I finished with them, the Holy Ghost drew my attention over to a girl that was in the youth group in this section. Nice looking girl with a church dress, very modest dress, high neck, long skirt. Looked like somebody that grew up in a Pentecostal church. About 16 years old. I said, stand up, young lady. She stood up, sobbing. I figured, oh, she's probably, you know, leader in the youth group or whatever. Very sensitive spirit. So I said, come here. And all I was going to do was lay hands on her to receive the Holy Ghost. But when she came close, the word of God bubbled up out of my spirit. And I said this. I said, now I can't tell you that you're called into the ministry. You're going to have to hear God tell you that for yourself. But I will tell you that you've always had a desire to help people. And when you saw me help those two people, you said to yourself, this is the best way to help people. And I said, if you'd like God will use you to help people like that for the rest of your life. And she shook her head. And I laid hands on her. And again, no catchers. She shot, not only fell down, up off of her feet and hit the floor, speaking in tongues before she hit the ground. And all the people are like this. So I thought, I'm going to quit preaching and get out of this town. These bunch of weirdos. So I get done preaching, wondering what everybody's problem is. The pastor's wife comes up to me white-faced like this. So I'm thinking I'm going to have to explain to her what the gifts of the Spirit are or whatever. She said, do you know who that girl is that you prayed for? I said, I barely know you. This is my first day here. <laughs> she said, that girl is president of the atheist club at the high school. And when, they, when we were announced these meetings, the kids at the youth group invited her to come. And she agreed to come with a notepad and pen to take notes on how evangelists trick people out of their money. But she said, because you came 25 minutes late, you didn't see. That woman that you called out for prayer was in the last stages of multiple sclerosis, all drawn up and stiff. Her husband wheeled her in in a wheelchair, picked her up out of the chair and sat her in the pew, you know, stiff, and sat her in the pew. And then he wasn't a Christian. She saw an announcement that we're having miracle services. Which back then I didn't even have any miracles. I just was trying to do anything to get more people to come. <laughs> sat her in the pew and then sat next to her. But before he did, he wheeled the wheelchair out and put it out by the coats. Now I'm going to tell you something. As much as I'd like to think that I'm a powerful man of God, if I saw a wheelchair there, I would have never gone and said, stand up. <laughs> no, stand up. But because she was just sitting there in a dress, looking like a normal lady, no cane, no wheelchair. And I said, you, stand up. That's why the whole church went. And then when I saw her, I said, no, no, don't worry about it. Just stand up. She, went, she wasn't shaking her head no because she didn't want to. She couldn't stand up. And then I'm looking like the biggest fool in the state of Ohio. The third time, look how skinny I am. The whole church is thinking, what the heck does that have to do with asking this crippled lady to stand up? But when I grabbed her by the arm and hoisted her to her feet, whatever had afflicted her muscles with the muscular, multiple sclerosis cleared out of her body, and that's why she was crying and looking like this. That's why her husband was crying, smelling like cigarettes. And I said, stand up and stand behind her. Neither of them saved. And when I laid hands on her, she started speaking in tongues. Hit him like a domino. He started speaking in tongues. People say, well, when, when did they get saved? 
They must have got born again sometime between when she hit him and when they hit the ground. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then I look over and continue to misread the situation. I think this girl's a youth leader. She's there as head of the atheist club to mock me. But when she got there 10 minutes early and saw the husband wheel the wife in, pick her up and put her stiff as a board in the chair and wheel it out. <laughs> and when the, when the power of God hit that woman and she went back into him, immediately all the unbelief cleared out of her heart and she began to cry. The ridiculousness continued. I call out the head of the atheist club and the first words out of my mouth. Now I can't tell you you're called into the ministry. You're going to have to hear God say that for yourself. No wonder all those people in Ohio, they weren't the weirdos. They, I was the weirdo. And that was true. I can't remember what she was studying in school, but she wanted to go into something to help sick people. And when she saw how God can cure them, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, you always want to help people. And when you saw what God did for those two people, you thought that's the best way to help people. And if you want, God will use you that way. Lay hands on the head of the atheist club. She begins speaking in tongues and falls over backwards and hits the floor. All the stuff she made fun of other people for doing. God made sure she did all of it at once. Roll around, speak in tongues, cry, smear her makeup. Hallelujah. You better wear my waterproof mascara to my meetings. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whole youth group with their jaw dropped. Girl comes to school on Monday. One of the professors said to her, well, what did they do at that meeting? How was it? She started to have her lip quiver and said, I got saved. I got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. I'm going to start going to the church there. You know, the teacher said because of what happened to her, he wanted to come and see what was going on there. Then the meeting starts to grow. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If I, I would have screwed the whole thing up, if I would have seen the husband coming in with the wheelchair, I promise you, especially at that point in my ministry, I said, I know one person I'm not going to say stand up. And if somebody would have told me ahead of time that the head of the atheist club was there, do you think I would have preached on the gifts of the Spirit? I would have preached my best apologetics message on how God really did create the earth, how the Bible really is valid, how you can prove it from history, but the Holy Ghost has his own way of moving. I mean, think of it. Listen to this. Who in their right mind would have the idea to launch the church by having, nobody knows how many people were there. There were 120 in the upper room when it started. And 10 days later, the Spirit of God fell. So there was a small group in an upper room, who would choose to launch the church with 120 people speaking in tongues? And you know where the Baptists miss it in Dutch Reform? They say, yeah, but then people spoke in tongues and the Bible says they were speaking in those people's languages. Now people don't speak in people's languages. It doesn't say that they were speaking in the people's languages. It says, and they heard them speaking in their own dialect. You say, what's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. Because, hallelujah, this man in the white shirt, I want you to take two steps closer to me. Lift both hands. I feel in my spirit so strong, the same way I prayed for my friend from Congo that was in Pennsylvania. I feel like the devil's surrounded you with other ministers that have like made fun of the old style African way of doing things and told you, you know, we have got to get more modern, that kind of thing. God has put in your spirit a strong anointing. That's why the devil's trying to discourage it. But I tell you, tonight, if it was for nobody else, it was for you to encourage you to press into the old school fire. And that fire will have the end. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. God's going to regulate. Your pancreas is going to regulate your blood sugar. I tell you, your blood sugar level is going to go to normal. And any blurriness... Or problem with the eye goes right now. All pressure from the eye goes. 
You will never lose your vision in Jesus' mighty name. This lady in the blue t-shirt. Come quickly. Lift both hands. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now listen. Don't let the same thing happen in South Africa that happened in America. Uh, you know who came from America? T.L. Osborne, R.W. Schambach, Oral Roberts, William Branham. And then some religious devil got the American charismatic and Pentecostal church to become embarrassed of what not only transformed our nation, but caused us to send that power all over the world. Don't let the same thing happen here. We don't need less of the Holy Ghost. Don't become an American church where if you want the Holy Spirit, you have to go on a retreat. Youth camp. The Holy Spirit is not the stepchild that the family's embarrassed of. The Holy Spirit should be featured center stage in every service. You need the Holy Ghost. I was preaching in Montreal, Quebec. In a, uh, this is why it's good not to know what's going on. I saw the Lord touching a man. He was crying. I said, stand up, sir. I laid my hands on him. He went out under the power. And this church was as stoic. Didn't like the Holy Spirit, even though it was a Pentecostal church in name. So he, he goes out under the power like you've seen these people do. Then all of a sudden, when I'm preaching, he gets up, screams at the top of his lungs, and runs full speed around the building. So I'm thinking, well, whatever. You know, you just have to act like it's no big deal, you know. But really, I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? He does one lap around the building. I found out later, they did a surgery on his sciatica nerve in his back and uh, severed the nerve. So he was totally paralyzed in his one leg. And so when he got up, he had full feeling in his leg. Got up, that's why he screamed. He could feel his leg again, and he ran around the whole thing. When he gets back to his seat, he runs, gets down on both knees, and starts begging his wife to forgive him. That man grew up in that church, got a job as a limousine driver, and as a limousine driver, you're always taking people to parties. Well, when he started, he would wait in the car for the people to come out of the party. But then he started going in and having a drink. Then he started sleeping with the bridesmaids, sleeping with the girls at the party, doing cocaine, left his wife, and his wife asked him to come to church. She told me, when you came over to my husband and said, stand up to lay hands on him, I was mad. I thought if you knew who this guy was, you wouldn't lay your hands on him and bless him. You know, it's funny, then why'd you invite him to church? Probably just wanted me to say, you dirty sinner, you're going to hell. But you'll see what the Holy Spirit does. He's not a discourager, he's an encourager. And I'll tell you another thing. If I would have known about him, I probably wouldn't have said that. I said, now you've messed up. But again, it's good to be in the dark. And so when I said, the Lord's going to touch you, he ran around and apologized to his wife. And the marriage was healed. Marriage counseling, he wouldn't even agree to go to marriage counseling. And even if he did, it'd just be two days a week. It's her fault. No, it's his fault. No, it's her fault. I'm telling you, if you knew her, I'm sure she's a witch. No, I'm telling you, if you know him, I'm sure he's a wizard. And they'd have got divorced. But the same spirit of God that cleared multiple sclerosis out and took atheism out of that girl's spirit, took that guy's hard heart where the devil had come in to divide their marriage, gave him a soft heart, and with no one asking him to, had him come. A guy that wouldn't apologize, now on his knees in front of the whole church, begging forgiveness. We must have the Holy Ghost. And tonight, when the Lord touches you, whatever the issue is, with your marriage, with your children, with your finances, with your health, there is nothing that's not covered in that sevenfold redemptive package. Wisdom, honor, glory, strength, power. God is going to give you a gift tonight because he was slain, not just so you could go to heaven, 
but that we might receive power, honor, glory, wisdom, honor, and whatever two I'm missing. I know tonight that God has rekindled in many. You don't move past it. Don't get too modern and think that was for the 70s. I tell you, it not only still works today, it works better today than it's ever worked. God is going to do something in you tonight and you'll never be the same in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that with me, stand up on your feet and give the Lord Jesus one more mighty Easter hand clap. Come on, take 15 good seconds. Stay on your feet. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Hallelujah. Lady with the blonde hair, I've already prayed for you one time. Come right forward. In Jesus' name. These men are not drunk. Drunk people don't speak in tongues. Drunk people act like that. That's why they thought they were drunk. Can you say amen? amen. Lift both your hands all the way up. I'll tell you, whatever the Lord started on Friday, he finishes. That's it, right into you. Filled in Jesus' name. More? In Jesus' mighty name. That's it. Never to be the same. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Timothy, I know, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. That is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. The laying on of hands is a conduit to receive the grace of God that's in one vessel to flow cheaply and freely into you. No money can't be bought. The only requirement is that you be hungry. That's why we preach like this, that the Holy Ghost will stir a hunger in you. Lord, I don't want to try to work life on my own. I want to receive thy power, thy wisdom, thy glory, thy honor, thy strength, thy riches, and thy blessing. And when you're hungry, God made a promise. I'm going to miss you. You're anointed. Take three steps forward. Lift both hands. Have your wife stand right beside you. Both of you lift your hands. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I tell you by the Holy Ghost, as the enemy has tried to keep property from you, and that's the only limitation that's on your ministry right now, not having a place to regularly meet. And I feel in my spirit, even though you didn't tell me, that they can yank the agreement if they want to. I tell you, the Lord's going to open up property and land where you're going to have a church that's going to grow. Take the African fire into your church and you're going to see a mighty revival sweep in that church just like you saw in your spirit. What worked in Tanzania will work in Port Elizabeth. It works all over the world. Be filled in Jesus mighty name. My friend in the white shirt, I think I pray for you every service. Come right down. You might want to wear a disguise from now on if you don't want prayed for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lift both hands all the way up to God. As you do, the fire of God falls on you. And strength for your body. In Jesus' mighty name. When we lay our hands on you, that's why. It's not a Pentecostal way to close a service. It's the grace of God in one vessel flowing into another hungry heart. You don't have to pay for it. We already took the offer. I'm not going to say there's seven people here that I believe are going to give $1,000. Come and I'll lay my hands on you. There's seven more that will give 100 Stay 10 feet away. And many will give less than 100 Don't even come near me. And you say Amen. God's going to touch you tonight. 
God's going to heal every marriage tonight. I said, God's going to, it's like people don't want their marriages healed. Whether you want it or not. If you wanted a divorce, you should have stayed out of my meeting. What God's joined together, no devil's going to tear apart. You're going to leave this meeting. If you've moved out of the bedroom with your wife, you move back in tonight in Jesus' name. I'm talking for couples that aren't divorced. If you got divorced like 11 years ago and she's in bed with someone else, don't join. You know, it'll, somebody's going to get shot. Everything the devil's tearing at in your life, your children, your marriage, your business, it is restored unto you by the power of God tonight in Jesus' mighty name. This man in the cream jacket, right here, come right forward. Just lift your hands right there. Strength. One of the sevenfold redemptive packages. God's going to put a quickening into your body where you'll have full strength from now till when you go to heaven. You will never know a day of weakness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Time to get down to business. Nine twenty six. <laughs> well, I like preaching in India. They say take as long as you want. I said, "Are you sure?" They said, "Yeah." I think by the time I was on my third interpreter with the other two laying down in the back drinking water, they wish they'd have told me keep it under seven hours. I love Jesus with all my heart. I got the nicest house I've ever had. Nice TV, few of them. Nice furniture, and I'm in no hurry to get home. I like the anointing. I like being at the altar. I love Jesus with all my heart. People are busy doing nothing. Just busy. Anytime you hear somebody say, I'm so busy, what they should say is, I'm so disorganized. You'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that gets more done in a day than I do. And I do it with ease. I've got time for God. Abraham had time for God. Isaac had time for God. You have to build time for God. And if you put God and his kingdom first, all the other things that you could die trying to get, he will just drop them in your lap. People have this idea, like you, you, you can't put God first and be productive in this modern hour. I'm flying a private jet to East London tomorrow. I'll be there in 14 minutes. When you put God first, all the other things you could be going after, you just make it easy. Can you say amen? Amen. I know people don't like preachers having a jet. Too bad. I'm going to sit in one with ease because I refuse to die not having shown my generation that there's a mighty blessing for serving God. Can you say amen? Lift your hands right there on your butt. In Jesus' name. Let the Lord keep working on you. Sorry, I forgot you're not supposed to say butt in church. Forgive me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No, this man here in the nice patterned shirt with a pocket with a bent, come right around. I tell you, the anointing's been on you strong, brother. In fact, you know, just stay right there. Lift both your hands. I see in my spirit that in order to serve Jesus Christ, many of your family was strongly opposed but you win anyway the Lord is going to honor you now with his anointing and all of the people that mocked and said negative things they're going to have to come back when they see what the Lord did with you and say hallelujah they'll know that it was God receive that gift now in Jesus mighty name that's it amen amen Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'll try to actually do the altar call this time. If you're here tonight and you got swept up in westernized South Africa and laid down the old fire of the Holy Ghost, maybe you never even knew about it till now. But you realize now God's woken you up. 
And you realize you're lukewarm. When Jesus said, I would that you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. See, that's what the American church is a specialist in. Lukewarm Christianity. It's not that they've totally rejected God. It's that they have enough of God so they're not ice cold, but enough of the world so they're definitely not hot. And Jesus said, I would that you be hot or cold, but if you're in the middle, lukewarm, how long will you waver between two opinions? If Baal be God, serve him. But if the Lord be God, serve only him. If you're here and you realize during the preaching that you've drifted away from your first love, you don't pray like you used to. You don't pray anymore. Don't read the Bible anymore. Every Sunday morning, you have to yell out, anybody seen my Bible? It's wherever you put it last Sunday afternoon. Never touched it in between. You go to church, but you're not on fire. You don't pray anymore. You've become a good Western Christian, and hell is going to be full of westernized, quote-unquote, Christians. Many will say unto me, not a few, many, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. And I will say to them, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I promise you, I don't even know who you are. The fire must never go out. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, while he delayed his coming, five that were ready let their fire go out. And when they called, Lord, Lord, he said, depart from me. I don't even know who you are. If the Lord has used this service, everybody stop moving around. If the Lord has used this service to wake you up, that you've allowed, not even, do you understand? Jesus told a parable in the book of Luke that three people that missed heaven, one's excuse was I just bought a piece of land and must inspect it. Not I'm raping people. Not I'm murdering people. I have a real estate deal and I need to give my attention to it. Please excuse me. Another, I just bought a team of oxen. I just bought some automobiles and I got to tend to it. Please excuse me. And the other, I just got married. Domestic life, business life, cost the three people heaven. You can't put anything before Christ. Jesus will either be everything or he'll be nothing at all. And I know many people, the Lord's woken you up tonight to get rid of Western living and come back to your first love. Get rid of sin and be saved because Jesus is coming soon. When you see the signs for Armageddon, Iran getting nuclear missiles ready to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, that's a battle called Armageddon, and the rapture happens a minimum of seven years before that. So if you see the signs of Armageddon right around the corner, how much closer is the rapture? You need to be ready now. Jonathan, I have to sort some things out. You've never got them sorted out. What makes you think you're going to get it sorted out? Jesus didn't say, get your life together and then come to me. He said, come just as you are and I'll give you new life. If you're here on the balcony, you're here on the floor, and you know that if the trumpet was to sound in 60 seconds, you would not be taken. You would be left. But today, God has extended another day of grace to be saved. He died for you. He was raised for you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. Come to heaven with me. Jesus paved the way, but you have to accept it today. If you need to do that today, either for the first time or you fell away and need to come back, quickly put your hand up high and wave it at me in Jesus' name. Keep it up. God bless you in the balcony. God bless you on the floor. Many hands. Many hands. Everyone in the balcony, begin to come now. Everybody on the floor, begin to come now. Come right to the altar and we're going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Come now. That's right, you can clap. It's a wonderful thing. Come. Don't miss heaven by 30 steps. Don't miss heaven by 40 steps. Come all the way to the front. All the way to the front. Keep coming in Jesus' name. 
This is your day. Come. In the balcony, come. I'll wait for you, but come. In the name of Jesus Christ, keep coming. Keep coming. God bless you, young, old, middle-aged. God bless you. It's not too late. It's not too late. But you need to come now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Anybody else? I see more coming. Biggest altar call of the week. Anybody else? God's wrestling with your heart. Make this your night. God bless you guys. Come right to the front. Find a space. You're as important as anyone else. In the name of Jesus. And just let the Lord begin to touch you at the altar. As you've given him your heart, now he's going to give you his life. All those blessings that he died and was raised that you might have. You're going to receive them right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Those of you that are at the altar, lift both your hands to the Lord. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. In other words, I'm going to give you the words to say. And God's going to hear this prayer. Forgive your sin and then give you power to live for him. You're never going to go backwards anymore. Only forward. In Jesus' name. In the gray sweatshirt, come right up. In Jesus' mighty name. Stand right there. Lift both your hands. Listen to this. If the devil had his way, he keeps bringing up one thing you did wrong and making it like because you did that, it's over. But I tell you, the Lord not only forgives you of it, it's totally cleansed and you won't miss it in Jesus' name. Filled in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't let the devil beat you up. You're a new creature tonight. Say this out loud from the depth of your... Wait, this lady in the black right here and boots, red nail polish. Lift both your hands all the way up. As you do, the power of God falls on you right now. The Lord's bringing you back right now, just like with the prodigal son. He's waiting with open arms and brings you all the way back in right now. You'll never miss it again. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. More, more, that's it. More, that's it. In the name of Jesus. Now all across the front, say this from the depth of your heart. Say, dear Heavenly Father, louder. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I've come forward tonight to give you my life. I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for restoring me. Say this, I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and my Savior. Say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. Now say this so every devil can hear you. Say, I am saved. I am a Christian. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. And I will not turn back. In Jesus' name. Amen.